What could have driven Henry David Thoreau to spend much of his life seeking the true nature of the Native American Indian? What we're going to do tonight is ponder the mystical nature of a mountain and the mystical nature of Henry Thoreau and the mystical nature of the Native American Indian. Mystical, of or stemming from direct communion with ultimate reality or God, of or having a spiritual reality or import not apparent to the intelligence or senses. The future is the key. And I have a sense of the incredible potential of the love in the human heart and the love in all of creation. I will ask you to ponder the pieces of the puzzle we're going to offer you here tonight and see if, if there might be a perspective from which we can open our hearts and minds and become peace and justice and freedom all those things that we're carrying in this flag that we're waving these days. And uh, Gandhi said, we must become the change we wish to see in the world. Albert Einstein saw the world as a puzzle meant for deciphering. And Ro Roger Rosenblatt in his 1999 Time Magazine article, The Age of Einstein, stated, Einstein understood that the world was a puzzle created for deciphering and more that a person's place in the order of things was to solve as much of that puzzle as possible. That is what makes us human, this and the governing elements of morals and humor. Well, Thoreau, in, in, when he wandered around Concord and he found arrowheads all over Concord, he picked those arrowheads up and he said, here is a character that has yet to be deciphered. Thoreau, the ethnologist and Thoreau's Indian Notebooks. From a very early age, uh, Henry Thoreau was uh, enamored with the Native Americans uh, of New England. Um, from a very early age, he was collecting arrowheads and spear points. Uh, he seemed to have a knack for finding those sort of artifacts all over Concord. In fact, he said the soil of Concord is arrowheadiferous because it was so easy for him to find arrowheads. Um, natives lived in this area for almost 10,000 years. As much as sportsmen go in pursuit of ducks, and gunners of musquash, and scholars of rare books, and travelers of adventures, and poets of ideas, and all men of money, I go in search of arrowheads when the proper season comes round again. Journal, March 28th, 1859. So it was very easy for him to find those sort of artifacts in the soil of Concord because they were all farmers here when Thoreau was here. So they're always turning up the dirt and always turning up arrowheads and old sites of campfires and lodges and stuff like that. The larger pestles and axes may, perchance, grow scarce and be broken, but the arrowhead shall perhaps never cease to wing its way through the ages to eternity. It was originally winged for but a short flight, but it still, to my mind's eye, wings its way through the ages, bearing a message from the hand that shot it. They are not fossil bones, but, as it were, fossil thoughts, forever reminding me of the mind that shaped them. I would fain know that I am treading in the tracks of human game, that I am on the trail of mind, and these little reminders never fail to set me right. Journal, March 28th, 1859. There is scarcely a square rod of sand exposed in this neighborhood, but you may find on it the stone arrowheads of an extinct race. Far back as that time seems when men went armed with bows and pointed stones here, yet so numerous are the signs of it. 
the finer particles of sand are blown away and the arrow points remain. The race is as clean gone from here as this sand is clean swept by the wind. Such are our antiquities. These were our predecessors. Why then make so great a do about the Roman and the Greek and neglect the Indian? We need not wander off with boys in our imaginations to Juan Fernandez to wonder at footprints in the sand there. Here is a print, still more significant at our doors, the print of a race that has preceded us, and this, the little symbol that nature has transmitted to us. Yes, this arrow-headed character is probably more ancient than any other, and to my mind it has not been deciphered. Well, ever since I was a child here in Concord, I have uh, studied uh, the Indians of New England. Um, of course, I went to Harvard College and uh, we studied uh, Greek and uh, Roman philosophy and Greek and Roman uh, literature. Um, I think, however, that while those things are important and certainly have had a big influence on my life, uh, it is just as important to study the Indians. They are divine as well. And we can learn a great deal from the way that the Indian has lived here in our land, their respect for nature, their use of the land, uh, their belief that we are all part of the great spirit. The sun is going down and it's coming, uh, night will be coming on shortly. But in, in the Indian way, in the Indian thought that I have, is, is the sun, which I consider the son of the creator, the son of God, the very first son of God was created. And he let there be light, and there was light. At this present time, the sun is setting. The Son of God is now meeting. Oh, I have to explain. The Son of God is also our Father, the Father of all creation. And also, the not only the Father, but he, he is now going down and starting to join with the Mother Earth. The beauty of that sun set as the sun and the earth meet and spend the night together and waken in the early in the morning again. So I honor that, and I honor the Creator who made this happen, because without that we would, would not be here. So I thank the Creator for this, for this beautiful evening, this beautiful weather, the beautiful air, and all the beautiful people that's here. And I give thanks to the Creator. I say, Woolly One he continues, the Creator of all life. Woolly One he is, thank you. Gachiniwes is the creator. So when I say Woliwani, that is thank you, creator. So I say Woliwani Gachiniwes for this beauty that the earth, that the Father, Son, and the Mother Earth is showing us this evening. That is not only is beauty, but that's the love. That they're shown in the love of the two entities of the Father and the Mother as they join together for the night. And in the morning, they will arise again and they will part. And they will again show the beauty of their love for all life on this earth and in this universe. That the Great Spirit created the world for our use, but also for us to live in harmony with the world around us. Again, you pause in wonder and awe at the Creator's, the way He treats us and shows us His love, His or Her love. We never, there's no gender in the Creator. That's why we call him creator. We don't say uh, man god or woman god. We say the creator of all life and all things. Men should not go to New Zealand to write or think of Greek and Rome, nor more to New England. New earths, new themes expect us. Celebrate not the Garden of Eden, but your own garden. He kept really detailed accounts in his notebooks of his Native American studies. Uh, he had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of books that he read about the Indians, um, uh, research that he did. Uh, he probably was going to write a book about the Native Americans. He never got around to it because he died at the age of 44. My name is Brad Dean. I uh, basically am a Thoreau scholar. I've been studying Thoreau now for I guess it's been close to 30 years, I hate to confess that, but it's been about 30 years um, since I first encountered Thoreau. Basically my area of expertise with Thoreau is his manuscripts. I reconstruct his manuscripts uh, to come up with works that he never lived to publish. So that's basically who I am and what I do.
What I'm working on right now is Thoreau's uh, notebooks on the Native Americans. Uh, basically, in uh, about the period of time right after Thoreau left Walden, uh, 1848, he possibly 1849, he began working on a series on a, on a large project that involved reading everything he could find about the Native American cultures. And he had access to Harvard's incredible library, so he read practically every important uh, history or account of Native Americans, all the expeditions, all the archaeological studies that were being conducted at that time by the Smithsonian Institute, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and, and so on. He read uh, a little over, and he kept notes, by the way, and uh, there are a little over 500 sources. He seems to have been intent on studying, like a scholar would study, uh, indigenous cultures to try to find the embodiment of the, the wild. His famous, uh, Thoreau has this famous, uh, from his essay Walking, a famous quotation, in wildness is the preservation of the world. Uh, civilization entails a certain amount of self-consciousness, and I think Thoreau was trying to get a step away from that with his uh, idea of wildness. I think for Thoreau, the, the, uh, the red man, as he called him, was the, was the wild man in the, in the best sense of the term. So he wanted to see if he could understand the way the Native Americans related to their environment before they learned how to relate to their environment from, uh, from the white folks who were coming over. And it's a very interesting experiment and yielded, as I said, these 12 notebooks. And these notebooks that I'm working on now, I'm editing as 12 manuscript notebooks, about 4,000 manuscript pages, uh, basically his reading notes um, from that project. And you can see a lot of Native American attitude in his writings. Uh, the way that they respected the land, he respected the land in the same way. Uh, and that was from a very early age. Uh, there's even a, a brief journal entry when he's younger, I think in his teens, where he's writing in fake Indian language, you know, me love him type stuff. But he's not doing that because he's being a racist. He's doing that because he really admires the Native American spirit and the Native American mind. And that was the way it was for his entire life. The evidence of Thoreau's early interest in Native Americans pretty much is that. It's a very stereotypical, romantic sort of view. It's the Hiawatha syndrome, you know, uh, me tanto, that sort of thing. It's not very sophisticated. It's what you would pretty much expect a young man in uh, earlier mid 19th century America to have kind of an unsophisticated attitude toward Native Americans or sort of romantic attitude toward Native Americans. What you see throughout his life is a much, much more increasingly sophisticated uh, interest. His interest towards the end of his life is very, very, uh, um, even beyond scholarly. Um, he wants to know, he's adamant about getting his mind around what Native Americans are really like in Native American culture, not the way they actually were, well, in addition to the way they actually were in mid-19th century America, but also anti-Columbian, before Columbus discovered the New World. Now, if you think about it, in a sense, it's kind of impossible to do that, of course, because uh, you have to rely on what, there's oral traditions, I suppose, in the Native American cultures. There's uh, archaeological digs. Uh, there are uh, the early accounts, and for Thoreau, Thoreau's purposes, the most important source were the early explorers' accounts of the discovery of the New World, Cabot, up at Nova, was it Nova Scotia? North of Nova Scotia. Anyway, was it? Where? Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Um, and so on. So Thoreau read Smith and all the early explorers, uh, did quite a bit of work in Canadian, very early Canadian history. Uh, if you've read Cape Cod, you know he did a, he read all the explore and presented his account in Cape Cod of the early ex earliest explorations in uh, New England. And what he was again trying to do with the Native Americans was to get his mind around the way they were before the Europeans. I don't know if you want to say corrupted them, but anyway, changed them. Uh, it is something that we need to learn as an American people, as we expand westward, it is something we need to learn as a modern civilization that the uh, native civilizations that were here before us are worth studying and worth learning from. There is a great love that exists from the Creator who created the Father and the Son, Father, Son, the Mother Earth, and that is generated and shown to us. This is the love that the Creator has for all people and all things. 
now life in the universe. Thoreau's attitude about science, what we now call science, and in fact Thoreau himself called science, and Thoreau had a different attitude about something he called natural history, or on occasion he called it natural philosophy. And Thoreau's attitude about science, well, he generally was antithetical to science, generally. Um, and let me exp I think this example will give you uh, some idea of what I'm talking about. In 1853, March of 1853, he received a letter from Spencer Baird. Spencer or Spencerton? Spencer, right? Spencer Baird. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Spencer Fullerton Baird. That's why I keep getting messed up. Um, <laughs> in uh, March of 1853, and, and that uh, early in March of 53, and Thoreau wrote in his journal that evening when he, he had been obviously been thinking about this, getting this letter, and here's what he writes in his journal. Baird was the secretary of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. The secretary of the Association for the Advancement of Science requested me uh, by a printed circular letter from Washington the other day to fill the blanks against certain questions among which the most important one was what branch of science I was specially interested in using the term science in the most comprehensive sense possible. Now, though I could state to a select few that Department of Human Inquiry which engages me, which, uh, yeah, which engages me and should be rejoice and should be, and I think it should be, should rejoice at, the op at an opportunity so to do, I felt that it would be to make myself the laughing stock of the scientific community to describe or attempt to describe to them that branch of science which specifically interests me, inasmuch as they do not believe in a science which deals with the higher law. Higher law would have a particular historic context in this sense. It was often used in the, in the slavery debate, for instance, with Seward talking about the higher law, the laws of conscience, as opposed to the constitutional law. So. Um, that's, in a sense, that's the kind of a context for what Thoreau means about a higher law. So I was obliged to speak to their condition and describe to them that poor part of me which alone they can understand. The fact is I am a mystic, a transcendentalist, and a natural philosopher to boot. Now I think of it, I should have told them at once that I was a transcendentalist. That would have been the shortest way of telling them that they would not understand my explanation. <laughs> Thoreau after seeing phosphorescent wood in the night. A scientific explanation, as it is called, would have been altogether out of place there. That is for pale daylight. Science with its retorts would have put me to sleep. It was the opportunity to be ignorant that I improved. It suggested to me that there was something to be seen if one had eyes. It made a believer of me more than before. I was prepared after this to hear of the most startling and unimagined phenomena witnessed by his folks. They are abroad at all hours and seasons and scenes so unfrequented by white men. Nature must have made a thousand revelations to them, which are still secrets to us. The same experience always gives birth to the same sort of belief or religion. One revelation has been made to the Indian, another to the white man. I have much to learn of the Indian, nothing of the missionary. I am not sure, but all that would tempt me to teach the Indian my religion would be his promise to teach me his. Where is all your knowledge gone to? It evaporates completely, for it has no depth. The Allagash and East Branch, the Maine Woods. I don't know why, I think it's a fascinating thing, but he wrote this in early March, 1853. That's when he got the letter. He did not send the form back, for some reason I can't understand, until the 19th of December, 1853, which is, you know, what is that, about 10 months later? Poor correspondent, I suppose. Um, but in the, I remember he says here that uh, he was obliged to speak to their condition and describe to them that poor part of me which alone they can understand. Here's what he wrote in Branches of Science in, in which a special interest is felt. Thoreau wrote, the manners and customs of the Indians of the Algonquin group previous to contact with the civilized man. That's, I read this to uh, Ed Wilson one time and he couldn't believe it. He said, what do you mean? Thoreau didn't. He wasn't an ethnologist at all. Well, in fact, he was. Nobody knows about it yet, but... Um... Thoreau's primarily regarded as a botanist, biologist, someone who's interested in nature, not in human, not in human beings, not in ethnology. But in fact, from a scientific point of view, that was his primary interest. And I think it's important to understand that for Thoreau, scientifically, this is the distinction that he would make, the object of science is to get rid of subjectivity. Thoreau, when he wanted to know flowers, apples, and, and botanical, the botanical world, 
wanted to have a subjective response to those as well as an objective, you know, study them objectively. But when it came to Native Americans, he wanted to know objectively what were Native Americans like, not what he thought they might be like, not his preconceptions, but to try to wipe those preconceptions away to find out the way they actually were. And that effort to discover Native American cultures objectively is evidenced very clearly throughout his notebook. And I think what what Thoreau means here is, again, it hinges on this notion of science as opposed to natural history. Thoreau obviously was interested in pumpkins and pine cones and uh, fishes and all kinds of things, but he wasn't related, or he wasn't, he was interested in them as natural history, not as science. And what I mean is that in natural history for Thoreau is an attempt on Thoreau's part to get to know what he called the infinite extent of his relations to a particular, for instance, a pine cone. He wanted to know the, the literal history. How did the Indians use them? How did the Greeks use them? How do chipmunks use them? How do squirrels use them? How, you know, how do you name the various parts of the, of the pine tree and so on? Uh, what do they taste like? What do pine tree seeds, what do pine seeds taste like? Those sorts of things. It's very subjective as well as objective, whereas with the Native Americans, he was studying the Algonquins to try to get a very clear, objective, more objective sense of the way the Native Americans lived before contact with the whites. I think one of the things that will surprise quite a few people, particularly people who have a more stereotypical notion of Thoreau, you know, Thoreau, the latter-day hippie, Thoreau, the, uh, the uh, rebellious uh, young man, uh, and so on. A lot of people will be probably fairly surprised when my project is published at the level of sophistication that Thoreau achieved with, with his ethnological studies. Um, prior to this project being uh, published, very few people will have known about Thoreau's study of Native Americans, and as a consequence, uh, when this is fairly well known, when it is published, a lot of people are going to be set back a bit, I think. Um, and what they're going to find is that Thoreau was pre not preeminent, I would say, among the ethnologists of his time. I think there are people like Schoolcraft and some others who were, uh, had much greater breadth and depth, depth than Thoreau did as an ethnologist, but he was very sophisticated, uh, if not the preeminent, certainly among the top ten, I would say. We do know early in Thoreau's life that he actually met real live Indians uh, on the shores of Concord. The uh, Native Americans would, of, that, of that general part of New England would come through periodically. So he did meet Indians early on. However, later in his life when he made excursions, as he called them, to, uh, for instance, the Maine woods, he also made an effort to get Native American guides. I narrowly watched his motions and listened attentively to his observations, for we had employed an Indian mainly that I might have an opportunity to study his ways. Thoreau on Joe Attian, first Indian guide, Chesuncook, the Maine Woods. He made three trips to, to the Maine Woods, and on his third and final trip, he met a gentleman named Joseph Polis, who was uh, a member of the Penobscot tribe was fairly prominent in the Penobscot. He was kind of like a leader of the Penobscot tribe. Thoreau hired him to be the guide. They went into the woods for a period of time, quite a long period of time, and Thoreau got to know him very well. So well, in fact, and so impressed was Thoreau with him that towards the end of his life, uh, it became very clear, and, and Emerson and several others had pointed out that Thoreau had three, uh, again, at the end of his life, that he had three heroes, you might say. One was Walt Whitman, one was John Brown, the famous abolitionist of uh, Harper Ferry's fame, and the other was Joe Polis, this uh, Native American guide. Thoreau, in his book The Maine Woods, write about, writes about his relationship with Joe Polis, and it's a fascinating relationship. He was stoutly built, perhaps a little above the middle height, with a broad face and, as others said, perfect Indian features and complexion. His house was a two-story white one with blinds, the best looking that I noticed there as good as an average one on a New England village street. He was one of the aristocracy. It appeared that he had represented his tribe at Augusta and also once at Washington, where he had met some Western chiefs. Also, he had called on Daniel Webster in Boston. On Joseph Polis, 
the Allagash and East Branch, the Maine woods. One of the interesting things is to speculate about why Thoreau found Joe Polis. You know, what was it about Joe Polis that Thoreau found so fascinating, so intriguing, that put him in his, not even pantheon, it's just the top three people in his life, these are the big heroes. What was it that caused Thoreau to like Joe Polis so much? I think it was that Joe Polis embodied a kind of a synthesis of Native American cultures and white culture. That Joe Polis was able to succeed and flourish in, white, in the white community. He was able to be a leader not only in the Native American community, but also in its interactions between the Native Americans and the white community. Uh, but also was able to go out into the woods and uh, behave, you might say, as a Native American very successfully could keep himself alive in the woods and even comfortable in the woods. And Thoreau was very impressed by that. My companion and I had each a large knapsack as full as it would hold, and we had two large India rubber bags which held our provisions and utensils. As for the Indian, all the baggage he had, besides his ax and gun, was a blanket, which he brought loose in his hand. However, he had laid in a store of tobacco and a new pipe for the excursion. On Joseph Polis' baggage, the Allagash and East Branch, the Maine Woods. We put tobacco down for everything. We thank the Mother Earth for what we get, like all, this, all these things here, which are, to a lot of people are things or plants, but there's medicines in almost everything you see around here. And, and this is how the Creator took care of us and took care of our people and showed us how to live and, and not to have to be in want of anything. And, and we didn't. We were never in want of anything because the medicines were there to heal us, the, the animals were there to feed us and clothe us, the trees there were there to shelter us, and that's how our people lived for thousands of years, thousands of years. Our Indian said that he was a doctor and could tell me some medicinal use for every plant I could show him. I immediately tried him. He said that the inner bark of the aspen was good for sore eyes, and so with various other plants, proving himself as good as his word. According to his account, he had acquired such knowledge in his youth from a wise old Indian with whom he associated, and he lamented that the present generation of Indians had lost a great deal. Joseph Polis as a doctor, the Allagash and East Branch, the Maine Woods. We talk of civilizing the Indian, but that is not the name for his improvement. If we could listen but for an instant to the chant of the Indian muse, we should understand why he will not exchange his savageness for civilization. Sunday, a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. Thoreau's experience on Mount Katahdin and the contact passage from the Maine woods. Katahdin, I want to present to you the idea that Katahdin, which has always been known and honored by the native people as a sacred mountain, I want to present to you the idea that I believe that this mountain is a transmitter of that truth frequency that I was speaking about. And I, I'd like to give my thoughts on what mysticism is, because it's one of those words that sort of sits out there and who knows what it means. And to me, it's, it's like a frequency, and, and it doesn't matter where, it's like a radio wave, that it doesn't matter where you are on the planet, when you've been on this planet, that, that when you tune into this frequency, you get the same information. It's like driving down the, the highway of life and tuning it up that radio, and sometimes it has static, and sometimes it's clear, and sometimes it's not there at all, and I, and I believe that, that all of us hear this frequency at some point in some ways in our lives and that our great leaders and great authors and great uh, artists have, have tapped into that, that frequency to a point where they've taken it public and, they, and, it, and it's, it's directed their actions and then that is what has made them great. Everyone who goes on that mountain or those who have their receivers, their systems set on receive, as opposed to send, um, get 
information and get feelings and get a sense people say that mountain is alive that mountain has a character of its own some say they see god when they go on that mountain it's 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 almost universal that people have an extraordinary sense of this mountain and it's it's known that 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 mountains and there are areas throughout the world that are vortexes of energy and and i believe that katahdin is a vortex of this this frequency of truth. How did Mount Katahdin influence the life and thinking of Henry David Thoreau? Thoreau famously stayed at Walden Pond for two years, two months, and two days between 1845 and 1847, almost exactly halfway between the period of time, if you take both ends and meet in the middle, about halfway during uh, Thoreau's stay at the pond. He went to the Maine woods, his first trip to the Maine woods. Kind of like a vacation halfway through his experiment at Walden Pond. And uh, the high point of that trip for him was his climb of Mount Katahdin, uh, which he wrote about later in an excursion or an essay that he wrote called uh, Simply Enough Katahdin. It's the first chapter of the Maine woods. The summit of the essay is Thoreau's uh, fairly well-known. How many people know the contact passage? What, Okay, I'm going to read it here in a second. <laughs> Never heard of it. Um, basically what it is is Thoreau's account of going uh, from Concord all the way up to Maine and then the climb of the mountain. On his way up Katahdin, he was going with an, a party that he was with, and then the, the other members of the party fell behind and Thoreau continued up through the clouds, went up onto a tableland, we don't know for sure if he actually achieved what we now know as the summit, but nonetheless, he thought he was at the summit, and he was standing up there looking at this very strange landscape. If anyone's ever been up there, it's a, it's, a, I think it's fair to say it looks otherworldly. It's very unusual landscape. This experience of seeing that landscape under the circumstances that he saw the landscape. Uh, caused, obviously caused certain feelings in him. Thoreau is up there and he has this almost sort of out of body experience, but I would call it an otherworldly experience. He, in a sense, lifts the veil from his perceptions and is able to in a, have a kind of a direct relationship with the environment and to see, uh, as I put it in, in, a, in, a, in an introduction that I wrote for one of his later books, he's able to see the miraculous in the commonplace. I want to put it in a particular context. Um, in Walden, Thoreau says that he went to the woods to, li to live deliberately and front only the essential facts of life. And at the end of the paragraph, he says that once he had confronted the essential, or fronted the essential facts of life, if he found them were sublime, he would, he would write them up in his next excursion. And the next excursion he wrote after he wrote that paragraph, of course, was Katahdin. So in a sense, I think it's f somewhat fair to say that this passage that I'm going to read here in a second is one of the essential facts that Thoreau learned when he was at the pond, or during his experiment at the pond. I stand in awe of my body, he writes. This matter to which I am bound has become so strange to me. I fear not spirits, ghosts of which I am one, that my body might, but I fear bodies, I tremble to meet them. What is this titan that has possession of me? Talk of mysteries, think of our life and nature, daily to be shown matter, to come in contact with it. Rock, trees, wind on our cheeks, the solid earth, the actual world, the common sense. Contact, contact, who are we? Where are we? This is kind of, I think for Thoreau, this is kind of a seminal experience. This, an experience that you have out in the world that gets you down to some of the most foundational, fundamental questions, questions that even involve who you are, questions of identity, uh, epistemology. I mean, again, some of the most philosophically basic questions. In Thoreau's studies, there, this is a very controversial passage. It's been written about by many different scholars. Um, the cons not the consensus, the, well, I guess it is a consensus. Most of the scholars who read this assert that Thoreau here is traumatized by what he sees on top of the mountain. 
I happen to think they're they're dead wrong myself. Um, I think, and I'll, maybe I'll read myself here because I think instead of trying to get it off the top of my head, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you what I think. The carefully crafted prose of the contact passage reflects not emotional turmoil, but the finer frenzy of Thoreau the Transcendentalist prophet straining the capabilities of language to describe the, what Emerson called the original relation to the universe he, Thoreau, experienced atop the mountain. This important passage is Thoreau's attempt to articulate the ineffable, for Thoreau on Mount Katahdin, like Moses on Mount Sinai, had beheld God, or spirit, and nature, or matter, face to face. Um, so you can see I have a somewhat unconventional or uh, different interpretation of the, of the uh, con contact passage. You have Moses on top of Mount Sinai, basically, being able to look at the Holy Land, uh, those sorts of things. But on Mount Sinai, Mount Moses is up there and actually has, in, in the Jewish Judeo-Christian tradition, actually speaks with God, experiences and, and communicates with the divine. And that's what's going on, I think, with Thoreau. He's tapping into that. He's trying to use the same, uh, he's trying to use that tradition to deepen the uh, flow of his own narrative. In other words, you have Thoreau on Mount Katahdin, you have Moses on Mount Sinai. There's a correspondence between the two, and Thoreau is attempting to leverage that correspondence to basically make his own essay a scripture. Well, what Thoreau's doing here in Katahdin, I think, and, and, in mo and frankly in a lot of his best writing, is he's trying to tap into this whole experience that you could call the prophetic tradition. In the prophetic tradition, at least from a Judeo-Christian point of view, you have the prophet who is a part of civilization and separates himself or herself from civilization, goes out into the wilderness. Uh, and in the Judeo-Christian tradition, for 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness and eats uh, locusts and honey and then comes back. But while they're in the wilderness, they have this kind of a foundational experience and, and they're able to see through the appearance of things to the reality and bring that spiritual truth back into the human community and tell people in that community what's real as opposed to what appears to be. Uh, that what we all take to be commonplace, something like a wafer of bread and a little bit of wine. I mean, they're very commonplace things, but if they're imbued with a different vision, they become purely sacramental. Uh, miraculous uh, to these people who in, in certain religious traditions and what Thoreau I think says is that that particular insight that these mundane things are at one moment mundane but can be somehow transformed into miraculous uh, perception you just need to learn how to look at it somewhat differently and it's transformed into something quite miraculous uh, ritual, of course, is one way that, for instance, the Catholic Church has a particular ritual that involves, and not only the Catholic Church, but certain uh, in the Christian tradition as well. You have uh, the wafer and, uh, of course, being the, the, uh, the body of Christ and, and the wine being the blood of Christ. And what Thoreau is doing in his later work, he wrote a book called Wild Fruits, which explores that entire sacramental tradition and, and leverages that insight from the Judeo-Christian and other traditions for his own transcendentalist, American transcendentalist purposes. But it's basically trying to take uh, the insight that all nature is miraculous and bring it into contemporary American life. Just one, uh, one thought, um, as you were saying, he said his church was, uh, was out there. Uh, I, had, I had given a similar uh, uh, quotation to um, to a priest inside of a church one day I was talking to him on Indian Island and uh, I was explaining how uh, how very sad it was inside that church and uh, and I said well and it's, it's it's very but it's very nice I said when uh, when you have your services on Sunday it's it's really really good because the people are very very uh, very uh, reverent and uh, and they feel from their spirit. You can feel the energy in there, the spirit of those people that knows this. 
and then you give your um, you give your uh, sermon. I said, and then uh, after the service is all over, everybody goes out the door, and uh, it's done till the next week when they come back again the next Sunday. I said, but for for me, when I walk out that door, I said. Um, I, I leave this church, but I said, my church is right there, outside of that door. When I see the sun, when I see the clouds, when I feel the wind and the air, and uh, I said, that was my church. Looking towards the future. As a mother, I'm looking to the future of what my children, the world my children are going to live in, and my grandchildren, and I, I truly believe that America is going to realize that great vision of our founding uh, fathers. And I also believe that this is going to come through the heart of America, that, that the human heart is full of love, and that, that America, we have, we have the, the setup, the systems that we have in place are vehicles for the realization of the beauty and the love in the human heart. So I'm excited about the future and, and, and what we all can become and bring to pass and, and lead the world in a heartfelt, heart-opening uh, way of living on Earth. We create the world we're in, and if we can look inside and, and see who we are and what we truly want, our government will reflect those desires. In a little book called Mystics as a Force for Change, an India Indian named Ghost states, Mysticism proposes a revolution from above and by consciousness. To say technology is the grammar of the future is dangerous nonsense. Technique and transcendence must learn to work together. That would be the beginning of the total man and totality thinking. And the individuals who will most help humanity in the hour of crisis are those who recognize a willed change from within as a step to a total change in our relationship with reality, the harmony of the whole. He further states, the issue is plain. What is the true nature of things and how do we embody it in our social living? Well, Albert Einstein stated that no problem was ever solved in the same consciousness in which it was created. We have built a house of cards on a false foundation of false assumptions that our logical minds have given the information we have responded logically and have gotten us to where we are right now that once we have and come to grasp the correct accurate information about the nature of the universe that our logical minds will take us to peace on earth will have us bringing heaven on earth and that's what I believe to be so. Until we come to understand the actual, factual existence of a broader reality than the one the scientific paradigm explains, which at this point we are, are tied into the limits of the scientific paradigm, once we add to that this broader, reality which which really is found I believe in this the, the spiritual nature of the human of all of creation basically which is what the Native American in the in the their core understanding and beliefs have access to and understand and live according to that until we open our hearts and minds to this broader understanding of reality that we cannot get to that vision of peace of freedom of liberty and justice for all that this country has promised the world it would be so this is the message I try to convey that to let all people know that every one of you is loved by the Creator and knowing that there's a possibility that maybe Somewhere, some people will be able to give, be given that love as well and to be able to extend that to other people around them and to share it and with each other and all your family and all of the other people you come in contact with. 
so we saunter toward the Holy Land, till one day the sun shall shine more brightly than ever he has done, shall perchance shine into our minds and hearts, and light up our whole lives with a great awakening light, as warm and serene and golden as on the bankside in autumn. Conclusion of Walking, Henry David Thoreau.